conclusion of the sermon, worshipers filed out of the sanctuary and greeted the minister. And as one shook the minister's hand, he said, thanks for the message, Reverend. You know, I bet you're smarter than Einstein. Beaming with pride, the minister said, why, thank you, brother. As the week went by, the minister began to think about the man's compliment. The more he thought about it, the more he wondered why anyone would deem him smarter uh, than Einstein. So the following Sunday, he said to the man, exactly what did you mean that I must be smarter than Einstein? And the man replied, well, Reverend, um, they say that Einstein was so smart that only 10 people in the entire world could understand him. But Reverend, no one can understand you. <laughs> you know, a laugh when you're trying to be funny is just as encouraging as an amen. amen. But they're easier to get. <laughs> At least with this crowd here. <laughs> After the death of King David, his son Solomon became king of Israel. David united the ten tri the 12 tribes. And then Solomon became king. Solomon was the second son of David's uh, marriage to Bathsheba. The first one, of course, uh, as you know, died because it was a result of David's sin and his indiscretion. But God enabled Solomon to reign with great wisdom and God rewarded him with wealth and honor because he asks for wisdom to know how to rule. Solomon's downfall was that he married foreign women and he allowed the worship of their gods in Jerusalem. And toward the end, he even participated in those things. First Kings 11, first 11 verses. King Solomon, however, and this is about... This is about the downfall of three different men, but it's kind of related here. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. Pharaoh's daughter, Egypt, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, six kingdoms from which he had 700 wives of royal birth. Think about that for a minute. I mean, where did they come from? 700 of them. He wouldn't know them if he bumped into them on the street. Anyway, as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Would you bow your heads with me, dear Lord, as we look into these things of, in your word, Lord, we pray that you, that you will open our hearts to wrap around your word. And we pray that this word will go where you want it to go and have the effect in our lives that you want it to have. In Jesus' name, amen. The Molech idol. By the way, the Molech and, and Chemosh and Baal were all pretty much the same. But the Molech idol was a large, hollow, brass statue with the head of a bull. Um, 
and the and the bulging belly of a man. So was Baal, and they, they were all the same, and the same demon. It was designed like an old-fashioned pot-bellied stove with the belly as the firebox. A child sacrifice laid on the hands would roll into the fire in the belly cavity. These were living children, living babies. Scripture describes this practice as passing through the fire to Molech in Leviticus. He did the same, verse 8, for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their God. And what were they offering? Children. Living children in the fire. I read one place where they played music and, and stuff real loudly so they wouldn't hear the screams of these children. They were babies. Baal worship was the same, Chemosh, Moloch. The Lord became angry in verse 9. Hey, who could blame him? With Solomon, because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. God is not mocked. If he says what we're to do, then we're not to do anything but that. Amen. Amen. So here's what happened next. Rehoboam was made the king. I'm skipping some of this because it's um, time-wise. But Rehoboam, Jer um, um, Solomon's son, became king. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had one time been in a high position under King Solomon, but he rebelled against Solomon, so he fled to Egypt. And what happened here in, in 1 Kings 12, 1 to 4, Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone there to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon. When he heard that, he returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and, his whole and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam. Picture this conflict now. And they said to him, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. So Solomon must have ruled them with some cruelty and a, and a heavy hand. So to abbreviate the story, Rehoboam threatened to be even more harsh than his father Solomon. So Jeroboam, son of Nebat, became the king of Israel. That is, now the ten northern tribes left and followed after him, which a prophecy had predicted. Uh, then in 1 Kings 12, 20, it says, When all the Israelites heard that Jeroboam had returned. See, he had been a, he had been a man of some stature in Solomon's court. They sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. Only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the house of David. But actually, Benjamin remained there too because it was on the other side of uh, Judah. But Judah is where Jerusalem was. So God had sent a prophet to Jeroboam, 1 Kings 11, 29 to 31. About that time, Jeroboam was going out of Jerusalem. And Ahijah, the prophet of Shiloh, met him on the way, wearing a new cloak. The two of them were alone in the country, and Ahijah took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into twelve pieces. They prophesied in, sim in symbolism back then. Then he said to Jeroboam, take ten pieces for yourself, 
For this is what the Lord of God of Israel says, See, I am going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give you ten tribes. So it was God's will for ten tribes to be ruled by Jeroboam. Now there's a division, and the northern ten tribes were called Israel, the southern was called Judah, and this went on for a long, long time. You know, almost nothing in history offends God more than idolatry. And this idolatry was evil, it was detestable, and it was disgusting. It was killing babies and acts of sodomy, which they used in their worship of Asherah. And the Asherah shrines were always associated or nearby to Baals or Molech, or Asherah had different names, but that is what they did. He thought that his people, those in the ten northern tribes would continue who I'm talking about who who thought this was uh, Jeroboam thought that his people in the ten northern tribes would go to Jerusalem to worship and offer sacrifices and he thought eventually they would abandon him and kill him so he made two golden calves 1 Kings 12. Now he had had favor with God. God gave him the ten kingdoms. And this is what he did. After seeking advice, in verse 28, the king made two golden calves. He said to, to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. <laughs> what an insult to God. Verse 29, one he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. Can you imagine what's going on in people's hearts, what they were thinking if they, if they just abandoned the God of Jerusalem and started worshiping these golden calves? Jeroboam built shrines in high places and appointed priests from all sorts of people, even though they were not Levites. He instituted a festival on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the festival in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. This he did in Bethel, sacrificing the calves he had to the calves he had made. And at Bethel he inst also installed priests, and the high places, at the high places he had made. On the 15th day of the eighth month, a month of his own choosing, he offered sacrifices on the altar he had built at Bethel. So he instituted the festival for the Israelites and went up to the altar to make offerings. So he, in other words, he had himself, he started a new, started a new religion. And he had himself appointed, he appointed himself as the chief priest. He created his own religion. Arrogance and stupidity all in one act. And now he is king over 90% of God's people. What was he thinking? Well, the Bible tells us that he was afraid that Israel would return to Judah and Jerusalem and that they would kill him. So in the interest of self-preservation, Jeroboam caused Israel to descend into idolatry and not just idol worship, but really disgusting, revolting things that they were doing. The very things that God wanted to eliminate from Canaan. Why he called Abraham in the beginning to go into Canaan. Because that's what those people were doing. And now they're doing it right with God's people. So here's another one. In 13 chapter of 1 Kings, a prophet came from Judah to Bethel. By the word of the Lord, a man of God came from Judah to Bethel as Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make an offering. 
See, he made himself a priest, and he appointed the other people as priests, no matter who they were. They were supposed to be Levites. So he was standing there by this altar. So he was deep into the idolatry that he had created with the golden calves. He seems to be believing his own nonsense. But he was an official in Solomon's court. He knew who, who the real God was. And he created these gods. Verse 2, by the word of the Lord, he cried out against the altar. This is the prophet, the, the man of God who came there. And, and, and Jeroboam was standing by this altar. So this prophet comes. He's referred to as the man of God. He cries out and says, altar, altar. This is what the Lord says. A son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. On you, he will sacrifice the priests of the high places who make offerings here and human bones will be burned on you. That same day, the man of God gave a sign. This is the sign the Lord has declared. The altar will be split apart and the ashes on it will be poured out. When King Jeroboam heard what the man of God cried out against the altar at Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar and said, Seize him! But the hand he stretched out, shriveled so he couldn't pull it back it was paralyzed verse 5 also the altar was split apart and the ashes poured out according to the sign given by the man of God by the word of the Lord then the king said to the man of God intercede with the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored so the man of God interceded with the Lord, and the king's hand was restored and became as it was before. The king said to the man of God, come home with me for a meal, and I will give you a gift. So this Jeroboam character that started a new religion and was standing there offering sacrifices to one of the calves he had made, he knew there was a real God that could heal. But he, would, but he diverted all of his people away from doing that. Can you figure these people out? Now God had told the prophet not to eat bread or drink water or return by the same way he came. So he refused Jeroboam's offer and he left to go home another way. He wasn't supposed to go back to where that altar was. He wasn't supposed to eat or drink anything while he was in the region of Bethel. There was an old prophet living in Bethel. His sons told him about what had happened with the man of God from Judea. The old prophet found him and persuaded him to go home with him, that is, back to Bethel and eat and drink there in order to go home with him. The man of God had to double back on his route, which he was not supposed to do very specifically. Mistake number one, he ate and drank the water in Bethel. Mistake number two, why would he do that? Well, the old prophet lied to him and he believed him. 1 Kings 13, 18 and 22. The old prophet answered, see, he's protesting. I'm not supposed to go back. I'm not supposed to eat a drink. This guy says, I'm a prophet too, just as you are. And an angel said to me, by the word of the Lord, bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he was lying to him. A lying spirit. Satan is the father of all lies. you got to be careful who you listen to. And this was a prophet who went there in the power and anointing and authority of God himself. So what happened? Verse 19, so the man of God returned with him and ate and drank in his house. While they were sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet who had brought him back. 
he cried out to the man of God who had come from Judah. This is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord and have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. You came back and ate bread and drank water in the place where he told you not to eat or drink. Therefore, your body will not be buried in the tomb of your ancestors. What's the matter with these people? He's, that, that's a correct prophecy. He lied to him to get him back there, and now he's telling him he shouldn't have done that. So the man of God, the first prophet, finished eating and went on his way, and he was killed by a lion. He made, he, he's, his one mistake was to believe what a man told him instead of what God told him. Because what God told him was spoken directly into his spirit. This man deceived him. And he went back. And ate and drank. And he was killed by a lion. We must obey what God says. Not what people say. That God is telling them for you. Somebody comes up to you and says, the Lord told me to tell you thus and such. Well, the Spirit always goes the way of the Word. So if it doesn't check out in Scripture, then that is not a, a true Spirit for you. Always check it out. Just don't accept. Just don't accept. You know, the Lord told me to tell you that you should sell your house and move to Alaska and get on a fishing boat and, you know... <laughs> How many people went on that mountain in Colorado because Jesus was coming back? So during these three events, we see the descent of God's people. Three of them. From covenant righteousness into terrible idolatry. A thing that God hates. Opposition to God goes way back to Eden. David was a sinner. He had his problems, but he had faith. He never fell into idolatry. He knew God, and he was a repenter. But these guys didn't do that. Solomon started out righteous. He was pleasing God. He ended up in terrible idolatry, and the devil laughs. Jeroboam started out in God's favor. The prophecy was he would have the ten kingdoms. I'm going to give those to you. He ended up in idolatry. Led a whole nation astray. And Satan laughs. The man of God that was sent to Bethel carried the word of God. But he allowed himself to be deceived. Satan laughs. The man of God at Bethel came at the moment of Jeroboam's manifestation of evil. He was at the altar, ready to sacrifice to one of the golden calves that he had made. And then he had caused Israel to worship. The man of God spoke directly to the altar. He didn't speak to Jeroboam. Jeroboam's heart was as hard as the stones. Maybe harder than the stones that made up the altar. God's power shattered the stones, but not the stony heart. The prophecy about Josiah would come to pass in 356 years about Josiah, one of the sons of David that would come. 356 years later that happened. And it was a very specific prophecy. Jeroboam asked the man of God to intercede for him, for his healing. But he didn't ask to intercede for forgiveness. Hard-hearted. The word of our God will last forever. Get worried, the Lord is forever settled in heaven. Forever. Idolatry. The lies of Satan. And lying prophets who pass away. There are those in high places in this nation and others 
who are convinced that the principles of living that we embrace and that come from God's word are harmful to their ideology, which is based in Marxism. It's also based on hatred and revenge. There are demons at work in people's minds and hardness of hearts. Alphabet names, BLM, CRT, Antifa, Satan laughs. How can you tell? They're idolatry. They sacrifice unborn, and in some case, cases, living babies. Baal, Chemosh, Molech, Satan laughs. Those demons are still here. Yes. Try to make genders different from what God created in children as young as eight years old. Glamorizing the gay lifestyle. Treating perversion as normal. Satan laughs. Well, I got an idea he won't be laughing when he's in the pit. He won't be laughing when he's in his permanent abode, the lake of fire. We might be laughing then. <laughs> Meanwhile, keep the faith. Don't allow the agents of Satan to lead you astray. We are people who are living in the favor of God. So were Solomon, Jeroboam, and the son of and the man of God from Judah. They were living in the favor of God, and they all fell. Solomon's downfall was women, 700 foreign women. Pleasing them instead of pleasing God. 700. What was he thinking? Who was he listening to? Stay true to God. Lean not unto your own understanding, the Bible says. We as believers must be extreme in our resistance to the attractions of the world around us. Satan is the God of this world. He uses every device at his disposal to attack faith in God. Don't be misled. Don't have a stony heart. Ezekiel 36, 26, 27. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. If you have trouble with a stony heart or a little bit crusty, it just starts that way. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 to 13. So if you think you're standing firm, and I read this before, be careful that you don't fall. They, had, they were living in God's favor, all three of them. And, there, and there's more of them in the Bible. They were living in God's favor. And the world's enticements drew them away. Be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Amen. Everything we see around us in the world, in Washington, D.C., in our country, is turning the Judeo-Christian world upside down. That's what they're trying to do. That's going to bring Jesus back. He's coming back. He's coming back. Praise his holy name. He's coming. And he's going to straighten out the whole thing. And Satan won't be laughing anymore. We'll be laughing then. Amen. We'll be laughing. Would you stand with me? Dear, we pray for each uh, each of us that are in the house today. And 
that we would be able to endure the temptations of this time and this age, Lord. We pray for the grace of God to reside and for our minds to be fasted on you, Lord. And help us to resist the temptations of the world, which are many and which are powerful. Help us, Lord, to just stay with God. Just stay. Just stay. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Amen. Fathers, pick a gift.